I think I would apologize for making it all sound so absolute. Um, you know, my approach um, at the time was very much, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, don't question it. And I think I would apologize for that approach. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today I'm joined with by Corey Smith. And uh, Corey is my former youth minister yep. at Risen Christ Lutheran Church in Fairport, New York. Fairport, New York, yep. And um, now he's living in Greenville, South Carolina. So I like that we've been we've known each other for 20 years now. Mm-hmm. This, mm-hmm. or uh, I guess not quite, but pretty much. Pretty close. Yeah. And um, we still stay in touch, and we don't talk all the time, but we mm-hmm. see each other every. You know, you came up to us, we go, and we yep. had lunch. Yep. And um, it's just interesting to from a distance kind of see how you have changed and grown and mm-hmm. your belief system has changed and grown mm-hmm. meanwhile i'm grappling with my own yeah. beliefs and trying yeah. to make sense of you know uh, you know make sense of how certain things make sense in my brain and right. they contradict <clears throat> other things in my belief system and right. and um and then just the the fact that we can have that conversation and you're you're dedicated to growing and developing mm-hmm. in, in your beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, what are, if you don't mind sharing, are there any like particular moments that you really kind of challenged what you had previously per- believed to be true without a question of a you know shadow of a doubt? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think just going back to you know to that a second that uh, I think a lot of times the church is afraid to let people question. You know, because they know that if they do question, um, you know, it's going to lead them down a road that could lead them out the door. Um, I was just reading an article just this morning from uh, it was on on my phone there. It was from Time magazine, you know, talking about the decline in church attendance and everything and just the decline in people who actually will say, yes, I have a church Uh, for the first time ever. That number is down below half. It's 47 percent today. You know, I mean, 20 years ago, it was, you know, it was closer to 60 percent. But the question is, why is that happening? Well, what happened 20 years ago? Uh, We had this thing called the Internet that was uh, that was really coming onto the scene. And it's a whole lot easier now to fact check uh, things that we're hearing from, you know, from the pulpits in America today. Um, you know, used to be if if the pastor or the youth pastor said something that you didn't know was, you know, whether it was really true or not. Um, go you know, get the Dewey Decimal System. Exactly. And you go into your board. library and try to find it if you really wanted to put that much effort into it. I mean, now you just pull out your smartphone and, you know, pull up Google and you've got you've got all the facts right there. Um, there's I'm not as hard line on things as I used to be. Um, You know, there's the there's the normal hot button issues that, you know, the conservative churches, you know, are always hammering on, you know, abortion, gay marriage, you know, anything having to do with sex, really. Um, Who cares? (laughs) You know, my approach in ministry has always been a very grace based, all are welcome Um, come as you are approach. I am not here to fix you. I am here to call you to be the best person that you can be, the best person that uh, that God has made you to be. Um, And so I've softened quite a bit um, on a lot of those things. Personally, I believe what, you know, what consenting adults want to do uh, in the privacy of their homes and stuff is their own business. Um, you know, I mean, I have, I have friends who are gay. I have, um, I've had kids in my youth groups who have been gay. I've had kids in my youth groups who have identified as transgender. And it was very, those were kind of defining moments for me. Um, I had a kid, uh, when I was in, uh, when I was at a, um, a parish in Ithaca, um, the parents came to me and not knowing what they should do with their kid, um, because their 15 year old son came to them one night and said, I think I might be gay. I think I might be gay. Not I am, but I think I might, you know, kids still wrestling with it. 
and these are good strong catholic parents and they know what the church teaches they know what they believe and they were actually talking to me about do we kick our son out and i said you do not you don't kick your son out <laughs> you know you love your son you you know god made him you know god made him that way and stuff uh, god doesn't make mistakes um, I had a student in a youth group in Corning that was um, identifying as transgender, and it was very clear that the parents had sent, uh, had sent him there to, uh, for me to fix. And I said, I'm not here to fix your kid. <laughs> you know, I'm here to welcome your kid. I'm here to love your kid. I'm here to introduce your kid to Christ. And, you know, if that's who your child is, then uh, you need to love your child. Do the do the these kids have a hard time um, going to a church that doesn't necessarily believe that the, the way they are is? Oh yeah, is, oh yeah. I mean, the one in, at the you know the transgendered one was there uh, by force, was not there voluntarily. Um, stayed maybe a month and then just uh, hadn't seen them again. So. Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, why would you go to a place that is, you know, blatantly saying, you know, you are both morally depraved and psychologically disordered? I mean, you're not going to walk into that place. You know, you're not going to want to find community in that place. Um, you know, if you do, it's because you're trying to appease family members and stuff, but it, it never ends well. It never ends well. Um, you know, I've had kids that, you know, have done all sorts of drugs. I've had kids that have been, you know, in trouble with the law. Um, but at the same time, the message is still the same. You know, God loves you and you are welcome here. You know, um, I'm not, I, my approach has never been to call people out, but to call them up. And ultimately, that's what Christ did. That's what Christ did. So, what are some questions that some of these kids may have asked you that you're like, yeah, that's a great question, <laughs> and and you know maybe even make you wonder the answer. Make me wonder, yeah. absolutely. Um, just the whole, um, I think the logic behind the existence of God, you know, or just the, you know, some of the stories in the Bible that we teach, you know, as literal truth, you know, I mean, all right, the story of creation in the Garden of Eden, okay, is it really about a dirt man, a rib woman, a talking snake in an enchanted tree, you know, or, I mean, if you go back in that, not to give you a long theology lesson here, but that story was written um, as, you know, as the Jews were in captivity, and, um, it, you know, it was written, uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, those are two separate creation accounts they were written 500 years apart from each other and stuff i mean so i mean no it's not meant to be taken literally uh, and what i would say i mean if you remember in, in even in confirmation class you know i said the one the one thing that we do need to believe is that in the beginning god and how the rest happened you know it happened you know we just we don't know how I think it's a great story. Uh, the flood story, you know, Genesis chapter six, Noah and the flood. Well, that comes straight out of the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you've, you know, if you've read that, you know, um, the story of Jesus, you know, the, I mean, it's just another story of one of the, one of the sun gods and everything. I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's this uh, interesting video out there. I mean, you take it with a grain of salt, but it's the Zeitgeist video. Uh, but there's this whole, I think it's like a 26 minute section of it that, you know, that compares the story of Jesus to the story of all these other pagan gods, you know. And it's not unique that there's a God that was, you know, born on the 25th of December, you know, had 12 disciples, was baptized uh, and, you know, died and, you know, came back to life and, and all that stuff. Um, I mean, the, the parallels are so similar to, you know, all the other pagan gods. And what the church would tell you is that, well, you know, those are stories that um, that were, you know, that were created by Satan, kind of like even the fossils and everything. You know, well, they were, you know, they were put there by Satan to, you know, to test our faith. But, you know, this is the real one and stuff. Um, personally, yes, I believe Jesus was a real person, um, you know, and yes, I believe that his mission was to come and, you know, to call us up, to call us into the very best um, sense of humanity that that we are, you know, that we are called to be. So 
Why do so many people feel so strongly about a text that maybe they've never even read or or a belief system that they aren't actually that familiar with? Because they know that if they question it, it's just a very slippery slope to, you know, questioning other things. Um, you know, if you look at the history of the church, even in America today, you know, I mean, 150 years ago, um, the church condoned slavery. You know, the church has always been on the wrong side of social issues. Um, the church condoned slavery. We were on the wrong side of that. Uh, the role of women, you know, women be silent. Uh, women should not be in authority over anyone. Well, you know, uh, Susan B. Anthony had something to say about that. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment had something to say about that. Um, and, and I think today the whole LGBT issue is another one where Has God we're going to find that, um, you know, that the church is on the wrong side of, yes. Has God changed in the last uh, 200 years? Um, no, God. I don't know that God changes. Um, God is. And it's, it's just a mind-blowing concept, you know, that God just is. And as we go deeper and deeper into the mystery of God, um, I think we discover more and more, um, you know, who God is and what God is all about. I think our concept of God changes over the years. You know, the Bible says that we are created in God's image, but I think we as church and just we as society in general have created God in our image. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, God, um, you know, God hates the same people that I hate and stuff. Uh, well, that's creating God in my image. So, yeah, and people will we talked about that people will pick and choose. It, absolutely. Um, like, you know, let's say prayer in school. Right. They'll say, uh, I want prayer in school as yeah. long as it's my prayer. Exactly. It's somebody else's prayer. Yep then I don't want it. Or in a government, you know, in a town council meeting. I mean, there was just a case in Florida uh, recently, I think within the last month or so, where they were opening their, their legislative session with prayer. And so it's like, okay, well, Equal Access Act says that you have to allow all in. Well, the Church of Satan uh, wanted to go in and <laughs> do a prayer. And I guarantee you, it did not go over well. That was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't go over well. That was probably well. the end of that. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but I even remember fighting that battle as a youth minister. You that's know, that's that, the whole um, idea behind the um, Church of the Fl Flying Spaghetti Monster. Yeah, I love the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah. Um, what are some misconceptions the general public uh, has about Catholicism or Catholic or Christianity generally? Um, right now, presently. Okay. Um, well, I mean, if you watch any of the South Park episodes on it, that's probably an answer to a lot of your questions. Um, if you watch The Simpsons, Ned Flanders, um, you know, that's no, not all Christians are like that. Uh, not all uptight. Um, you know, I think it's just you. I think there's a conception out there that you have to be perfect. You have to be a certain way um, for God, excuse me, for God to love you, for God, for God to accept you. And um, it's just not true. It's just not true. Is that why Christians don't have a sense of humor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I know a lot of Christians that have a sense of humor. I think God has a sense of humor, you know. Um, as far as the Catholic Church is concerned, um, you know, and it's one that unfortunately, um, you know, has been in the press so much, uh, the conception that all priests are molesting kids out there. Well, no, they're not. I mean, I know we're finding that it, there's been a lot of cover-ups and, you know, I'm ashamed of it. I'm ashamed of, you know, my bishops who have covered up, you know, and I'm ashamed of the bishops who have committed those sins themselves. I mean, there's there's a case right now, the, uh, the retired bishop of Albany, New York, Howard Hubbard. Uh, they're finding more and more that he was doing stuff to kids as, when he was the bishop. Um, you know, I mean, so yes, it's true, but yes, it's also a misconception that all do it. Um, I know some wonderful, wonderful holy priests in the Catholic Church, and I know this newer generation that's coming up now, uh, you know, they're taking it very seriously. And the church has taken some very strict measures, um, you know, to make sure that it, you know, that it doesn't happen and that it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, that it doesn't go under the rug. So. Why did you ultimately end up getting out of ministry? Um, church politics. Uh, church politics is worse than Washington. 
<laughs> um, and church people um, are some of the kindest, uh, best people you will ever meet. And church people are also some of the most evil, vile, hateful, toxic people you will ever meet. And uh, there was one parish that I was at for, you know, for five years that, uh, you know, I went in there to fix a very toxic situation and uh, it, it took everything out of me. And from there, you know, I went to another parish and it was kind of like going from the frying pan into the fire. Um, and it's just there were wonderful people that supported me, um, but it just it took too much out of me. Also, I think the church is, they just don't get it. You know, they just don't get it when it comes to working with, you know, with the younger generation. Um, they really, how do I put it? Um, they want you, they want the younger generation to try to fit their mold, you know, rather than saying, you know, let's just bring them in and, you know, make them part of us, you know, make the, you know, see how they can use their gifts uh, to enhance us here. Um, and granted, the younger generation, too, I think they're scared of the younger generation. Um, this is just my own personal opinion, but uh, the church has gotten so used to mediocrity uh, that when someone, you know, like yourself comes along or, you know, like, you know, someone of, you know, of that generation comes along that really approaches, approaches what they do with a standard of excellence. The church is afraid of excellence. You know, they've settled for 100% half-assed for so many years that, you know, mediocrity sometimes uh, looks like excellence to them. And then, you know, someone like you comes in and says, what is this? You know, 100% uh, half-assed is it, a great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, um, and I think the church is afraid of uh, a lot of the churches are still very much afraid of that. Hmm. You know, do you think they're headed in the right direction? I think some are. How about, how about as a whole? Are. As a whole, um, I don't see a lot of hope right now. I really don't. Uh, as you know, the church as an institution is dying. At least, it, well, yeah, in the United States, it's certainly dying in Europe. Um, you know, it's, it's thriving in the global south, you know, uh, South America, Africa, uh, places like that. But, you know, in the more developed, uh, developed places in the world, um, it is dying, you know, because people just don't see a need for it. Um, but yet I still talk to a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. I just don't go to church. You know, I don't believe in the organization. It's organized religion that they're uh, that they're turning their backs on. And, you know, as someone who worked in organized religion for 19 years, I mean, I, I kind of understand it, you know. I think I told you the other day that there's times I just want to go back to, you know, my old youth group kids and apologize for some of the stuff that I used to teach. And, uh, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's either dying or the ones that are thriving are your more fundamentalist type churches uh, down here in the Bible Belt. Mm. Um, because people, you know, the world is so screwed up right now that these fundamentalist churches, they're offering them something um, that looks solid, but it's only solid on the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, when you dive deeper and you start to examine it, uh, you find that, hey, it's, it's really not. You know? um, I have two comments. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, we, we talked about the, that the rejection of the institution yeah. isn't just in the, in the church. Right, right. It, it, it's basically um, the rejection of any institution. Mm -hmm. That could be... The, whatever the American dream is, right? It could be gender. <clears throat> yeah. It could be, um, you know, it's something super fundamental, or it could be an organized, you know, religious mm -hmm. church, and it could be, you know, here are our belief systems, and then we all go, well, I believe this, and that, and and that, and yeah. that, and, and, and that. We just kind of take a little bit from everything, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is scriptural. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, said to Timothy, he said. Um, uh, test all things and hold fast to what is good. Well, good and truth can be found in all different places, you know, not just within Christianity. So, Well, that's why I'm an optimist, because I think that this rejection comes from a place of critical thinking. Absolutely. Critical thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, one of uh, 
one of my uh, theological mentors, I guess I've told you about him. Uh, he's a retired Episcopal bishop. His name is John Spong, and I've read a ton of his books. And um, for, you know, about 20, 30 years ago, he was considered the most controversial uh, man in Christianity, in Western Christianity. Uh, but in reality, all he's doing is he's, you know, he's preaching things that the church has, you know, has known about, that theologians have known about for the last two or three hundred years. It's just it seems so controversial because, the, you know, the clergy have been so afraid to teach it and stuff. But uh, one of the things that he goes so far as, uh, as to question is the whole concept of Christ died for your sins. And, I mean, automatically when you hear that phrase, it, it puts a sense of guilt into you. Yeah, and you, you and I both know Christianity is all about the guilt, you know. Right. Catholic guilt. That's yeah, what you know, that's Catholic about. guilt, Lutheran guilt, whatever. I yeah. mean, insert denomination here and then the word guilt, you know. But that phrase, Christ died for your sins. And, you know, we're taught to believe, I mean, from, from an infant on that, you know, we are terrible, horrible, sinful, you know, sinner, sinful human beings and, you know... But what Spong is saying is that, no, Christ didn't come for that. John 10, 10, the, you know, people were asking him, well, why did you come? Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the abundance. Christ didn't come to save us from our sins. Christ came to call us, to call us up. Uh, to be, he was like the model human. You know, the church teaches he was both fully God and fully human. Well, he is the most full human being there is. He's the model for what it means to be a human being and to live life to its fullest. And that's why Christ came. You know, I mean, to call us up, to call us up into our humanity, to be the best human beings we can possibly be. Spong puts it this way. He said, um, you know, God is life. And so we worship this God who is life by living our lives fully. God is love. That's scriptural. First John 4, 8. God is love. So we worship this God who is love by loving others the way he loves, sacrificially, controversially, and sometimes even wastefully. And God is being. The word, um, you know, the word Yahweh, um, it's, it means I am. It is to, I mean, the actual word is to be. God is the ground and source of all being, and God is being itself. And so I am called to be, and you are called to be, the best person that God has created you to be. And that's, you know, that's what Christ came to do, to be the example of how we can do that. And so I think if the church starts taking that perspective, you know, especially with the young people, you know, a young person that comes in and has certain gifts, we should be celebrating that. You know, a kid can skateboard, great. How do we, you know, how do we help them to become the best skateboarder they can be? You know, whether it's to reach others or not, how do we help them? You know, it's not about, you know, us doing something for these kids. It's just about helping, you know, helping others be, you know, be the best they can. That That's love. That's, that's, that's love. acceptance. Yeah. 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 What I'm thinking about as we're having this um, conversation is for some listeners, we're blaspheming. I Absolutely. Mean, we're, <laughs> and we're in others, the Bible Belt down here. Believe me, I get it. Bless their hearts. <laughs> and for, but for others, we're yeah. evangelizing. Yeah. And so um, it's taken me 30 years to mm -hmm. really know and accept myself and know that I don't have all the answers. Right. But um, I believe that by having the conversation that maybe some people are uh, afraid to have or, mm -hmm. or, or asking those questions right. that – you know, having that critical thought, yeah. you know, that's growth, that's progress. Right. That's, um, it's terrifying to some. It's, you know, it's very terrifying when you don't have the answers. Yeah. You know. And then there, there will be some listeners that approach the world objectively mm -hmm. and just go, uh, you know, I'm not Catholic. I'm not Lutheran. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm, I am whatever I am, but I'm interested to know what Tyler and Corey have to say. Right. Kind of thing. Right. So, and those are the people that I think I tend to attract. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. How do you know you've actually made a difference in, um, the youths that you've mentored and coached and talked to their lives? 
Um, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, some of them have actually come back and told me and stuff. I mean, I remember I had a kid once that uh, it wasn't until he got into college and he came, he was home on break and he says, now I get it, Corey. I understand why, you know, why you did things the way you did with us and thank you. Um, you know, so some have been that, you know, so bold as to, you know, as to come right out and say stuff like that. With others, I think it's just been, we've stayed connected over the years. And I mean, what reason does anyone else, ha does anyone have to, you know, to stay connected to some, you know, 40 some odd year old guy that they knew 20 years ago and stuff? I mean, there had to be something there. Um, you know, and maybe this uh, 40 something year old guy actually still cares about some of these kids and stuff. So, well, you certainly remember you know. a lot about our group. Oh, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's evident. You me. guys had an you guys had an impact on me. I mean, I always refer to, you know, to the youth groups as my kids. And I think to an extent, I mean, I really did see you as my kids, you know, um, you know, I think that's why I never got married and had kids of my own, because I already had, you know, 30, 40, 50 kids and stuff. And uh, and it was nice to go home to an empty apartment and just not have any kids around. And, you know, yeah. We've, yeah. we've also kind of touched on um, how you've kind of approached things backwards. And mm -hmm. you, you did all your service up yeah. front. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, it, it's no secret. There is no money in, in ministry. You know, unless you're one of these uh, crooked televangelists out there. I mean, there's no real money in ministry. So, uh, you with know, the, there's... With the, the God-given private jet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there's a, there's an old saying that, you know, you spend the first half of your life on salary and then the second half of your life on significance. Well, I just look at it as I've reversed that now. Um, you mentioned, you touched on this a little bit. If you could go back and uh, apologize to some of these people you taught <laughs> back in the day, what would you say? Um, oh, wow. I think there... I think I would apologize for making it all sound so absolute. Um, you know, my approach um, at the time was very much, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, don't question it. And I think I would apologize for that approach. Um, there have been times where um, I have called kids out for certain things. And, you know, what and they never should have been. Um, I would probably go back and apologize for, you know, for stuff like that. Um, and I would just go back and apologize. I mean, just kids have been hurt by the church in general. Um, you know, I mean, as a Catholic, I mean, you know, I go to confession uh, from time to time, not, as, not nearly as often as I should. But, um, you know, I think there's times when the church needs to go to confession to us. Um, you know, and so as a former official representative of the church, um, you know, I would say if you've been hurt by any type of a, you know, of a church, you know, within Christianity, at least that I, that I represent, uh, I do sincerely apologize for that. Um, and if there's something that, you know, maybe I was personally a part of, um, I do apologize for that. That was never my intent to hurt. Um, you know, the intent is to bring people uh, into into the realization that they are loved and that they matter. So, as um, you know, who's somebody who's basically who went through it, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think what it gave me was just these foundational values, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's not a secret to you or probably most people that like I don't believe in everything that I was confirmed to, right. you know, a, as an absolute. Right, nor um, do I. <laughs> but I do have faith, mm -hmm. uh, so that still exists. And um, I look back at all of the things we did mm -hmm. very fondly. Absolutely. And, I mean, we had a lot of fun, for the sure. The lock-ins. <laughs> yeah, we had lock-ins. We did snow camp. Snow we camp. we did uh, Flower City Work Camp oh, where yeah. we went down into uh, inner city Rochester. Yeah. And we, we helped fix up houses. Yeah. And, um, you know, giving, you know, that instilled a sense of giving back. And um, I remember I um, – got kind of in trouble because it was a family, mm -hmm. a African-American family mm -hmm. with like three or four boys. And I was supposed to be, you know, stripping wallpaper off in the hallway, but all the boys were upstairs in the attic playing, 
PlayStation. And so I got in trouble because I was up there. You playing, were up playing PlayStation. I playing PlayStation with them. <laughs> nice. And, um, <laughs> And uh, then uh, now I'm part of a service organization, uh, and I was also popping around a lot. And yeah. So that's how I was able to get away because I was supposed to be doing this, that, and the other right, thing. Right. But I, yeah. they said like you, he's the guy that you, you never saw him actually working. You just saw him walking around. He was just going around. Yeah. Typical teenager, you know, yeah. finding ways to get out of work, but. Yeah. But you were building relationship with those kids. Yes. You know, yeah. and I'll bet you to this day those kids probably remember you. I remember them. Yeah. I mean, not by name, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, so now I'm part of a service organization called the JCs. Yeah. And um, I was awarded um, uh, Jack of all trades. Nice. And it's like, hmm, that's never changed. So I you're still... the one that's still just going everywhere and not really doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. And then um, what's something you're like Let's really see. proud of? Um, from ministry or just. Yeah. I'd like to know about ministry and then maybe also just personally. OK. All right. Um, ministry wise, hmm. that's a, that's actually a tough one. Um, yeah, there were certain you know, there were certain things that um, certain programs, I guess, that I that I created uh, that we um, certain situations that that I was able to be a part of turning around. Um, you know, I guess I'm I guess I'm most proud that. Um, I was able to be, you know, be the conduit that gave people like you those types of experiences, you know, like Flower City Work Camp, um, you know, and that you're still those experiences are still messing you up today. <laughs> you know, um, you're, you know, you're still doing service. That was an experience that impacted you so much that, you know, now even today as you know, as an adult, you're still doing it. You're still out there doing it. So, um, and I know for a fact that there's other kids that have taken those experiences too. Uh, there is a kid in the youth group, Sam, uh, who's doing the same thing up in Rochester. He's working with Habitat for Humanity. And again, that came from, you know, our group doing Flower City Work Camps so many years ago and stuff. Uh, and there's just, I hear stories all the time of that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I consider that a success. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, you know, and just in general, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm just me. <laughs> is there some, is there something that you were like really afraid of? And when you, um, that you had to overcome ever in your personal life? Um, actually taking the plunge and leaving ministry, you know, um, I just, I finally got to a point where I knew it was time to get out. And I say, I have to, I should say professional ministry, as in, I don't get paid to do it anymore. I'm not on a church staff or anything. Uh, you're always in ministry, you know. This right here is youth ministry. <laughs> you know, you're one of my kids, Tyler. So, you know, I mean, but um, you're never Except we're, now we're close in age. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it you was know? before you were the adult. <laughs> That's that was right. The kid. That's right. You yeah. know, but. Um, but I mean, as far as, you know, yeah, I think actually taking the plunge to get out of professional ministry more so because it wasn't just, a, you know, it wasn't just what I did for a living, um, but it actually defined me for who I was. Um, you know, I was Corey, the youth minister, and over the last well, almost five years now, um, I've had to get to know. Corey, <laughs> you know, and that's been a very interesting process, you know, and who am I really? I mean, now I'm actually away from that. And, you know, I've tried different, different career paths and everything, but just to, you know, being able to take the time to, you know, evaluate what is it that I actually believe, you know, cause I'm no longer obligated to believe certain things and teach certain things. I can just be me. And so it's been, uh, it's been scary, uh, but it's been it's been a fun it's been a, it's been fun too. So, do you still carry any guilt for leaving? No, not at all. Great, not at all. It's awesome. Um, I miss the kids, um, and there's certain things you know. I'll look back at certain churches and I'll see you know certain things that happened after I left. In in most cases, when I would leave a church, um, I would always try to leave it in such a way that they could just build on and take it to the next level uh, from the foundation that I was part of laying. Um, and in most cases, that's what happened. Uh, in a couple of cases, that's not what happened. 
and stuff and it just either went the opposite way or it just died completely so um, I feel bad for those kids uh, that suffered from that um, but as far as guilt from leaving it no I don't I don't if you could leave one lasting message with a young person mm -hmm. um, what would you say um, if you are a person of faith and you're struggling and you're questioning um, keep questioning because it's in that struggle it's in that question that you're actually going to find yourself falling deeper into the mystery of faith and the mystery of God um, if you are not a person of faith uh, and just know that no matter what, um, you are loved and you do matter. Uh, and I know somebody needs to hear that message, you know. Um, but you just know that, yes, there are people that love you uh, and that you do matter. Uh, and don't ever forget that. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that would be that would be my message. So. Um, without names... Would you mind giving that anecdote about um, the person that kind of switched off the uh, the thinking? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe why that's not encouraged? That's basically yeah. going against what you just said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, had a student in one of the youth groups and came into the youth group, I think it was in seventh or eighth grade, you know, all the way through high school and stuff went through confirmation and this was a kid that was just always asking questions and they were tough questions i mean this was a very sciencey kid you know um i was homeschooled so i mean i don't know much about science uh admittedly i the more i learn the more i'm fascinated by it but very he was very much into science um and just it was just questioning everything uh, and he was also the type that he wasn't going to just say something to go along. He wasn't just going to go along to get along. Uh, and so it came time for confirmation. And, you know, he went through the two-year confirmation process. And it's getting closer to the time to actually get confirmed. And uh, he said, Corey, I, I can't do it. I just can't do it because I don't believe this stuff. And so I said, all right, well, you know, is there anything specific that you can, you know, that you don't believe? And, you know, we talked through some of that. And after talking through it with him, um, I said, yeah, I agree. You should not get confirmed. And, you know, he went in, the pastor called him in, called his parents in, uh, and really tried to strong arm him into um into getting confirmed because in the Lutheran church, you know, you are asked um, certain questions. And the last question that you're asked before you're actually confirmed is, do you intend to continue steadfast in this faith, in this Christian faith and suffer all, even death rather than fall away from it? If so, then declare your intention by saying, I do so intend with the help of God. And I think that's the question that he was struggling with. Uh, and he said, no, I can't say that. I can't honestly say that. I would be lying to everybody if I said that. And, I don't even remember saying that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, I, I know the liturgy. I know the right. You, you did say it. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, regardless. I'm um, sorry, Lord. That, <laughs> forgive it. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyways, um, he, you know, it ended up, he ended up not getting confirmed. Yeah. And, um, you know, still continued active in the church and everything. But I met him uh, probably about seven, eight years ago at a wedding, uh, at a mutual friend's wedding. And by this point, uh, he had gotten married and stuff and had just done a complete 180 and was now, you know, annoyingly Christian. <laughs> And so I, you know, I, I finally asked him after we had talked a little bit, I said, what happened? You know, how, you know, how did this transformation happen? And it really bothered me what he said. He said, I just had to turn this off. And it just, 
I'm like, I would much rather you just keep thinking and keep struggling, you know, than just turn it off and just go along to get along. You know, it's not about blind faith, you know. Um, you know, intelligence is the glory of God, <laughs> you know. It makes people uncomfortable when they can't yeah. think of something as finite and right. concrete. Right, Yeah. right, Yeah. you know. Um, you know, and it's this whole thing of, you know, the whole question of faith and God and everything. It's one that's never going to be um, answered, you know, on this earth. You know, I don't think it will. Um, you know, just it's just a, God is not a mystery to be solved, but a mystery to behold. I guess that's my hmm. that's my approach. So this has been great. Yeah. This has been great. I didn't know that when I uh, came to Savannah on vacation, I'd be doing my first podcast. I figured, so. well, I have you. Yeah, there you go. Well, so. <laughs> and and ultimately, um, I've, I'm toying with a couple other podcast concepts, concepts, okay. and I do like the idea of doing one centered around spirituality and, right, and religion right, yeah. and general philosophy, I guess, right, as well. Right. So. Yeah, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. In, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and cre creative professionals to help discover their path to success. Um, to give episode feedback or, or guest suggestions, you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com, or if you have questions for Corey, you can send them there as well. Uh, and uh, we do have a, a store at creative-truth.com. We've got mugs, we've got shirts, we got hats, we've got sweatshirts. Uh, check it out. I appreciate you listening. Corey, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Tyler. This is great. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.